Thank you very much, Ricardo. It's an honor to collaborate with you, with Paulo Vinciguera. Uh, we've known each other since I was a fellow with Steve Wilson in Seattle for more than 20 years. So I start with a, a little wisdom here. In the morning, you should wake up with some German wisdom from Friedrich Nietzsche. He who has a why to live for can bear almost anyhow. So when you think about the whys, you think about what, what is the purpose. And eventually we go from purpose to passion and from passion to results with a good path, with a good strategy. And when we have questions about what we need, I always struggle with the inter interpretation of corneal data. Corneal topography, the front surface evaluation is literally superficial. We have tomography, but we go beyond tomography to biomechanics. And you can see the deformation response from the Oculus Corvus, which is an ultra high speed shine flu camera that can integrate the data with shine flu tomography. So the Corvus will take 4,330 seconds in a second, so it's going to take 141 frames in about 31 milliseconds. And we can integrate this vast majority of data, a lot of information that we have from the velocity, the shape of the deformation. And if you want to express something, you want to express in an image. But if you want to have very good data from that image, you want to express that in a number. So when we started our collaboration, we talked about we need to have a number to summarize what we have on the Corvus as information. And the Corvus biomechanical index, or the corneal biomechanical index, that was very nicely described in this beautiful paper from Ricardo, that got the Troutman Award, which was the most important award in the ISRS in 2017. And a few years later, I was elected the president of the ISRS, thankful for most of this collaboration work, we have one number that express corneal structure. And this number is going to be integrated with corneal tomography. And we started the corneal tomography integration with a small collaboration between us, and this expanded to a huge international collaboration, which is something that is very important in terms of developing big data for artificial intelligence, but also having emotional intelligence or Einstein intelligence, as Sven Rezdorf mentioned on his uh, interpretation of the Corvus pathway for us to integrate big minds and having the best as possible. So we have the international collaboration study that came into the optimization of artificial intelligence. is integration and optimization. Integration of the data from tomography and biomechanics and also understanding on how to use this data in the best way as possible, which is the interpretation of the optimized artificial intelligence. So this was accepted as my AOS thesis, which is a very important organization, started in 1864 with scientific contributions for ophthalmology in the whole world. So the 10 years of evolution goes with significance. And a lot of people say, why this parameter is better than the other? You have to think about accuracy, which is understanding sensitivity and specificity. And you have to be a little keen on understanding of statistics. And the area under the curve of the re receiver operational characteristic curve is going to be statistically significant. If you go for TB1 V1 and the TBI V2 with a higher accuracy. So it's a huge step forward, and eventually is a step forward to get it better. But the paradox of perfectionism is important that we consider. This is not perfect, and it's not meant to be. The paradox of perfectionism is that it's getting better. We need to strive for perfection, even though we understand we eventually will never get there. But we have to optimize it. And the best as possible today to understand if I can have a laser candidate, a smile candidate, a surface ablation candidate, or if the patient is better for fake IOLs, you have the tomography and biomechanical index, which will be integrated with the relational tissue altered if you do laser vision correction, so that you can address the risk of ectasia. And that's the work we've done with the Brazilian Artificial Intelligence Network, which is a software that's coming soon. So I'm very happy and grateful to have Ricardo Vinciguera here for presenting some very important cases 
that illustrate and make the point on the importance, the relevance, and the clinical applicability of this work. Ricardo. Thank you very much for the introduction. So this is going to be, no, why it's, should have stayed there. Okay, so this is going to be a case discussion. Um, and we are going to start with an ectasia after smile. Uh, we start with the pre-op data. It's a 29 years old patient with normal preoperative topographic and tomographical data. You can see the subjective refraction, it was around minus four, and that's the lenticule thickness. After 20 months, there were clear signs of ectasia in the left eye and no clear sign of ectasia in the right eye that is being followed up. So um, this is important to show you uh, the left eye pre-op. You can see that it's not an uh, irregular cornea. There is no uh, significant increase in posterior or anterior elevation. And the central cornea thickness is around 530, between 540 and 500. Interestingly, we, uh, we were able to have also the uh, tomography of this patient, but also the biomechanics. And you could see that uh, the CBI was clearly abnormal. I remind you that the CBI uh, is, the cutoff is 0 0.5. But the, and the TBI was already borderline, and that's the first iteration of the TBI, the one that was published some years ago. But what is also more interesting is that if we uh, have used the new uh, TBI version two, we can see that now there is no difference between the two indices. So the two indices would have said exactly the same thing pre-op. So this is an example of two important things. The first one is that uh, with tomography alone, we cannot pick all the risky cases. And this one could have been prevented if we would have had this measurement pre-hop. And the second thing, it's showing that the improvement of the TBI with the version two uh, can also uh, improve sensitivity and specificity. Um, Renato, do you want to add something to this case? Thank you. So a lot of people in the beginning uh, uh, of when we first demonstrated, if you go back one slide, they would ask us why you have a lower TBI than a CBI. The way I interpret that is that the CBI is corneal biomechanics, is the closest as possible of the corneal structure. The tomography is going to be whatever happens with environment influence. So we have genetics, environmental. So the TBI is kind of a summary of what's going on between the genetical component for biomechanics and the understanding how the corneal shape is. With the new TBI, you improve with the training set so that the difference between the genetic component and the tomography component is closer. But it's still not 100%. So the more data you know you need, you need to have more data. So this is one of the very interesting things that we found with the advanced AI for that. So it's a very good example. Thank you for that. Absolutely. So well, this is just a post-op map, just to show you that it's actually a clinically relevant ectasia. Um, as a summary of this first case, uh, the first take-home message is that any kind of surgery can induce ectasia. Smile, LASIK, or PRK, and the uh, addition of extra will not make any difference. That biomechanics and tomography uh, are a good way to measure risk of ectasia post-op, and in this case, we could have prevented the ectasia to this patient. So now I'm going to speak about this other ectasia case that happened after PRK, again to stress the fact that any procedure can induce ectasia. This is a 23-year-old patient, so this is the first risk factor that probably you can see that is a very young patient, but you can also see that the refractive uh, correction was very low. It was around two diopters. You can see the, the topography. You can see that it is 
uh, quite a normal cornea. The thinnest location is 530, and the, uh, there is just slight uh, uh, asymmetry in the bow tie, but is very central. The Bailey Ambrosio pre-op in the right eye was 1.75, which is only yellow, so it's just slightly borderline. And in the left eye was 2.33, so still borderline. Interestingly, again, we would have a TBI version 1 pre-op that was 0.63 and a CBI of 0.80. So one is orange, the other one is red. And the other interesting thing is that, again, we have the improvement in the TBI version 2, and, uh, and they go in the same direction. I would like to stress one thing that basically me, Renato, and Paolo said for the last probably 10 years. You know, everybody was coming to us to say, oh, Ricardo, what is the TBI? Is it the combination of BED-D and CBI? And every time we were saying, no, it's not the combination of CBI and BED-D, blah, 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 blah. This time we have to change slightly what we are saying because in TBI version 2, actually the CBI is inside the algorithm. So we cannot say again that the TBI doesn't have the CBI inside because at the moment it's actually part of the formula. Um, do you want to add something more in this case, Renato? Paolo wants to add something. Just to say something for the audience because I think that people looking at this think I will never be able to operate anyone with this instrument, so I do not need that. But I can say the opposite. Sometimes what shows to be risky when we see the biomechanics is safe. We operate and we have an excellent outcome. So don't be scared about this, that even what looks to be normal, you will be not able to treat because it will be the opposite you will exclude the risky, really risky cases and be safe in the borderline that topography or tomography alone is not able to do. I agree. That's a very important message. We not only increase sensitivity to detect those high-risk patients, but also we increase specificity on that. And one very important point in this patient is at 23 years old. So at 23 years old with a 1.7 bad D, I would say it's better to wait. Yeah. Maybe waiting one or two years making sure this coin is stable. And once in a while you pick up a patient that during this follow-up, they progress to mild keratoconus. Still subclinical, but mild keratoconus. So it's important that we understand the longitudinal. And possibly the most important things for these kids is to tell them not to rub the eye. Absolutely. And that's again to show you the ectasia post-op. So a conclusion of the second case, that uh, the bad D was showing only slightly suspicious abnormalities. The CBI was already showing ectasia risk pre-op, and the TBI version 2 goes in the same direction. So even if PRK is known to be the one that is causing less damage to the biomechanics of the cornea, it can still cause uh, ectasia in risky cases. And uh, we wanted to show you this very interesting and super valuable patient because, as you can imagine, it's extremely difficult to have a patient that developed ectasia and that Corvis and Pentacam pre-op. We also hope that is because, you know, if you have Corvis and Pentacam pre-op, you will not treat risky cases. Uh, sometimes it happens anyway, and we were able to have these 14 eyes that had the Pentacam and the Corvis pre-op and uh, developed ectasia. And you can see that out of the 14 eyes, 13 of them had abnormal TBI version 2. So of these cases, more than 90% would have been prevented with the, the, the tool that we have now. Um, it's always important to remember that all technology is not perfect, so we will always have some outliers, and I would like Renato to expand on that. That's, that's a very important slide because uh, we can have ectasia without a risk factor if you just rub the eye a lot after surgery or if you just cut the flap deep. So the impact from the environment is always going to be something that we cannot measure completely because you don't have an eye rubberometer that will follow these patients up. So, but when I see this slide, I see that we still have room to improve. 
and it can improve with better AI for enhancing, optimizing the data from Corvus and Pentacam? Probably, I think so. Ethnicity is always going to be an issue that we have to address, and this is a very, very good opportunity to improve. But we need to go multimodal, and eventually epithelial thickness data, genetic data, will improve our understanding on this ectasia susceptibility. Thank you, Renato. And to wrap up, I'm going to show uh, a paper that I'm really proud of, that is optimization of the CBI for East Asian ethnicity. This was coming from uh, an idea that our Chinese colleague had, that the CBI was not performing as good as in Chinese population. So we had um, a conference call all together, and we decided that the first thing we needed to demonstrate that in healthy population, there is a difference in cornea biomechanics. And that was published back in February 2022. And we showed that actually uh, thickness uh, parameters, so the R A R T H um, and the stiffness parameter A1 and SSI were significantly different between Caucasian and East Asian population, in particularly Chinese. So this was the foundation of this other paper that we are also proud because was published this year in American Journal of Ophthalmology. So it's underlying how important this finding is that we were able to optimize the uh, CBI for East Asian population. And this will be launched very soon in the next months. So the software is already available. And uh, so it, it will be possible to select this optimized version of the CBI that is created for East Asian population. And I'm going to show you, for example, a couple of cases just to show you how important this is. So this is a patient that had already refractive surgery. It's stable for two years. And the cornea looks normal. You know, there is an absolutely normal cornea. The problem we had before is that the CBI was 0.60. So there was something that was not, you know, perfectly fitting our idea. So there was something wrong. So with the new East Asian uh, population CBI, you can see that now the CBI is in, normal, in, in the normal values. So it was obviously not created to fit patients that were not making sense. We were just improving the detection of keratoconus in East Asian population. So, we hope that this will help in ectasia detection and refractive uh, screening for East Asian population. We are planning to probably optimize this for other population. Obviously, it was easier with Chinese because we have really, really a lot of patients, so it was very easy to optimize, but there is a plan to optimize for other ethnicities. Thank you very much.